Okay, cool. So we are going to be going over note zero in CS70. Um, this one talks about kind of all the notation that we're going to be looking at this semester. And we're going to start off with what is a set. So a set uses this type of notation, these curly braces. And it's basically a collection of unique items. And we can have these items to one, two, three like this. Usually the items are the same type, for example, integers. And a set like this of two, three, and one would be considered the exact same as this set right here. Okay, that's essentially what a set is. Elements in a set are also called members. Um, next, what is cardinality? Cardinality is represented by these vertical lines. So if we say P is equal to, you know, one, two, three, and capital letters are usually used to represent sets, then we'll, we'll say the cardinality of P is equal, sorry, is equal to three. And that's just tells us what the size is. Um, there's another type of set, or there's a certain kind of set called the zero set, which looks like a zero with a slash through it, like going diagonally. And that is just an empty set. There's just no elements in it. Okay. Um, next, we're going to talk about subsets. So what a subset is, is any set of a given set that is using the same elements or fewer of those elements. So again, using our example from above, where p is equal to one, two, or three, a subset of p would be something like one and two, or maybe just one, um, but also one, two, and three. And basically, if a is a subset of b, so let's say a is equal to a subset three, and actually let's set this equal to b. Basically, it would be like a and then a u that's facing this way. Is that right? Yeah, u that's facing this way with a line under it. So a would be that symbol and it would be under b. And there's another type of subset which is called a proper subset which is essentially a subset of A that is not the exact same set of A. So it could be one, two, it could be one, it could be the empty set. It just can't have all of the exact same members or elements as A. Okay, next we're going to talk about intersections. So um, an intersection between two sets, say we have set um, you know, A is equal to the set of one, two, and three. B is equal to the set of three, four, and five. The intersection of two sets is the set of all values that are common between them. So um, let me see. That would be, let's say C is equal to the union of A and B. And the symbol for that is kind of like an arc. It's like an upside down U. It's kind of like that, I guess. And I have a drawing pad. I don't know why I haven't been using that, but from now on I will. So the intersection between A and B would simply be the element three. And similarly, the union between two sets is, um, all of the values held across these two sets. So say this, in this case, C would be equal to one, two, three, four, and five, right? So the way I like to think of this is the intersection is kind of like an and between two sets. So everything that is in A and in B, so that's three. And then unions are kind of like the or operation. So the set of all items that are in A or B, okay? 
Um, let's just see, okay. Next we're going to talk about complements. So the complements between two sets, let's say um, in this case, let's actually just copy the ones from above, that would work. The complements between two sets is everything in the first set that is not in the second set. And what that would look like would be this sort of slash, or it could be, it could also be a minus B. So it's everything that's in A that is not in B. And what that would look like as a set would be just the elements one and two. And yeah, because that's everything that's in A that's not in B. Okay, so that's, that would be, that's complements. Next, we're going to talk about common sets. So these are the five common ones and they kind of go in order of, I guess you could think of it as encapsulation. So at the smallest level, we have natural numbers and these are like the countable ones. So this is zero, one, two, two, infinity, positive infinity. Next we have integers, which is now a larger set of numbers. So that would be, you know, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, all the way up to positive infinity and then all the way down to negative infinity. And then we have a larger set of these numbers, which are the rational numbers. And rational numbers, let's say numbers, and the notation for this is the set of all um, fractions such that um, A is an integer and B is a non-negative or non-zero integer is what it is. So A is in, which uses an operation that kind of looks like an E, which um, I will draw really quick. Let me switch over to paint. So that looks like this. So basically we would say um, the set of all numbers A divided by B such that A is in Z, um, where Z is integers, or the set of integers, and B would also be in Z, um, but B would not equal zero. So we would say that um, in this way, and I'll actually put this down here. So we're gonna say, such that A and B are in natural numbers, uh, or sorry, not natural numbers, but integers, but B does not equal zero, okay? And this, this symbol right here actually looks like the zero set symbol, so I'll take off that slash really quick. This is just supposed to be a regular old zero. Okay, so we're gonna switch back to our notes. And Right, so that's rational numbers. Now, a, a super set of that is real numbers. And these are numbers that you can't really express rationally, such as um, pi or e, but they technically do exist on like a physical number line, like you could well, they're not rational, but I think you get the idea. The next step up is complex numbers. And um, these are like imaginary numbers, essentially. Okay, um, next we're going to move on to the Cartesian product of two sets. So I'm going to rip the example from the notes again. And let's say we have two sets 
that's one, two, and three. And then I think they used like U and V. And essentially what the Cartesian product is, is the set of all pairs, all unique pairs of elements across A and B. So we would have a set of, uh, let's say, U and one, we'd have a set of V and one, We've, we'd have a set of U and two, and then V of two and so on. And this would be the Cartesian product. I don't exactly remember what the symbol is. Let me just look for that really quick. All right, so I went ahead and made a little list of symbols and their Cartesian product is the same as the cross product. So it's literally just like an X between two sets. And so it would be the cross product of um, A and X, or sorry, A and B would be this, you know, if we completed, if we completed it. Okay, um, next we're going to talk about the cross product. And what the cross product is, is between two sets, or no, between a specific set, or sorry, this isn't the cross product. What I actually want to talk about is the power set of a given set. So say we have a set one, two, three. We are going to get the power set by getting every subset of this set right here and putting that into one large set. So, you know, the smallest one is the empty set, and then we could do one, then we could do two, and we could do three, and so on. And the cardinality of a power set, of a specific set, is two to the k, where k is the number of elements in um, the set. And to explain why that's the case, we're going to switch over to paint and sort of think about this. Um, so we can ignore this for now, this down here, and we can examine the set we were talking about, right? So the main intuition behind why the power set of a specific set is two to the K or the cardinality of it is two to the K is that for to generate every subset, if we were to do this recursively, say, we could decide to either um, keep, enter the current value, or to exclude it. So to sort of illustrate what I mean, um, in this case, we know that there's, there's the empty set, and then we can include this value. And so that's two. So that's, you know, two to the one. This is two to the two, and this is two to the three. And then for this set, we know we can include nothing, right? So say we include our first value of one. So this side is in, this side is out, right? So given that on this side we include one, now we have the two options to include two or to not include two. And then similarly, if we leave one out, we can decide to include um, two or leave two out. And as you can see, at each spot, we have two options as to whether or not we want to put it into our subset. And so these bottom nodes right here, they sort of represent each possible combination. So if we were to sum up all of these bottom nodes, then we would get all of the possible subsets um, of our actual set. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. I would take a look at this example, maybe draw it out yourself, um, the two to the three example. And moving on, we're going to hit what? One last thing. So this is going to be sum and product notation. So this is pretty straightforward. Hopefully we've seen this before. If not, it's totally fine. 
but I'm just looking for the symbols. Um, let's see, I didn't. I don't believe I put it down. So essentially, for sums, we use a symbol called, I believe it's sigma. Wait. Yeah, I think so. And we have a variable on the bottom called i. And we can sort of think of that as our index. And then we have a value at the top, which is kind of our ceiling. And that's called n. And we would say, you know, sigma. And then or I guess the sigma would face this way. And we'd say i is equal to 1. And then let's say our n was 4. That would mean that we're going to sum up all of the numbers between 1 and 4. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. And similarly, um, we can apply the same logic just using a different symbol here. We would use a capital pi in order to calculate the product of a range of numbers. Or it doesn't necessarily have to be um, you know, a direct range like that. We can have any sort of equation and we basically just iterate from the start to the end. So sorry I didn't have any visuals for that. I mean, I could have written it out, but we're going to move on to universal and existential quantifiers. So the universal quantifier is this upside down A, and that basically means for, for all, okay? The existential quantity or quantifier is saying there exists. Okay, and we're going to look at these two statements right here and determine their truthiness, I guess. So, and these are ripped directly from the notes. So we're gonna say in this statement, for every integer in the set of all integers, there exists some integer in the set of all integers such that that integer is larger than every integer. And if you think about it, you know, if you start at, you know, a large number like a million, you know that you can always find one that's like slightly above it because the set of integers is infinite, right? And then similarly down here, this looks the same, but it's telling a slightly different story. We're saying that there exists some y in the entire set of integers that is greater than all numbers in the set of integers. And we know that this last statement is not true because there is no one greatest number. There will, all will, be, there will always be a number greater than that, um, as we sort of said in this statement right here. So 